I don't always listen to podcasts, but when I do, I listen to STEM Talk, interviewing the most interesting people in the world of science and technology. Stay curious, my friends. Welcome to STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. Talk. STEM Talk. Welcome to STEM Talk, where we introduce you to fascinating people who passionately inhabit the scientific and technical frontiers of our society. Hi, I'm your host, Don Cornegas, and today we have Dr. Colin Champ here with us. Also joining us is Dr. Ken Ford, IHMC's director and chairman of the Double Secret Selection Committee that selects all the guests to appear on STEM Talk. Hello, Don. Good to be here with you. Today's guest, Colin Champ, is a young practicing radiation oncologist with deep interests in exercise, nutrition, and wellness, especially in the context of cancer. The second edition of Colin's book, Misguided Medicine, is out and doing very well indeed. In this book, Colin questions received wisdom and skewers some sacred cows, which he describes as medical myths. During our interview with Dr. Champ, we will touch on several of these myths. It always comes back to the sacred cows, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, I got to skewer them. <laughs> then he eats them. Yeah, the, I can't say anything as a vegetarian. So, <laughs> yeah, so I actually have a copy of that book right in front of me. And as is often the case, there are some quotes on the back cover singing its praises. I found one particularly interesting, though says, Colin Champ has applied Occam's razor to the muddled and often wrong-headed world of nutrition and exercise by producing an irreverent but actionable guide to better health while having more fun along the way. Hmm. I wonder who provided that rather pithy assessment of Dr. Champ's book. Oh, look, it was none other than the chairman of the Double Secret Selection Committee. Surprise, surprise. No, oh, busted. <laughs> but before we get to today's interview, we have some housekeeping to take care of. First, we really appreciate all of you who have subscribed to STEM Talk, and we especially appreciate all the wonderful five-star reviews piling up on iTunes. These five-star reviews really help make STEM Talk more visible on iTunes. As we announced in several earlier episodes, the Double Secret Selection Committee has been continually and carefully reviewing the iTunes reviews, with an eye towards selecting the best reviews to read on STEM Talk. There are extra points for pithiness, wit, and of course, lavish praise. If you hear your review read on STEM Talk, just contact us at stemtalk at ihmc.us to claim your official STEM Talk shirt. Today, our winning five-star review was posted by someone operating under the moniker Tom S. As soon as we hear from Tom S., a STEM Talk t-shirt will be on the way. Here is the winning five-star review. Dino Might, spelled D-I-E. N O M I G H T. Quite clever. Dino Might. Many thanks, Tom Schneider, MD. Well, thank you, Tom S., and the thousands of other STEM Talk listeners who have helped make STEM Talk a great success right out of the gate. Okay, now on to today's interview with Colin Champ. Fasten your seatbelts and check your ketone levels. Dr. Colin Champ is a radiation oncologist who treats all malignancies and has a special research interest in the treatment of breast cancer, central nervous system malignancies, and clinical nutrition and exercise relating to cancer treatment and prevention. Colin is duly board certified in radiation oncology and integrative medicine. He received his undergraduate degree in chemical engineering from the MIT and his medical degree from Jefferson Medical College of Thomas Jefferson University. He completed his residency at Thomas Jefferson University Hospital, where he served as chief resident. Dr. Champ's passion for exercise, nutrition, and health started at a young age, driven by his involvement in sports. This interest continued while he was an undergraduate at MIT, where in addition to his chemical engineering studies, he focused on learning the intricacies of health, exercise, and nutrition, and his obsession continues until this day. STEM Talk. 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 Hi, this is Don Cornegas, your host for STEM Talk, and today I'd like to welcome Dr. Colin Champ to the podcast. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm honored to be here. And also we have with us Dr. Ken Ford, IHMC's director and CEO. 
Hi, Don, and uh, welcome, Colin. Thank you very much, Dr. Ford. So, Colin, let's just get started talking about your background a little bit. Talk about your upbringing and how it ultimately influenced your career. Sure. Uh, born and raised in, in Pittsburgh, and by in Pittsburgh, I mean outside of Pittsburgh, because until recently, no one really was born or, or grew up in the city of Pittsburgh. Uh, so, you know, blue collar, hardworking, uh, steel town. My family structure greatly influenced my life. My grandfather was uh, son of some Austrian immigrants. My uh, grandmother, both of these grandparents lived right by me, was Southern Italian. Uh, and my dad's side was also Irish and Southern Italian. And my grandparents helped raise me. My, my grandfather was this kind of guy where, you know, didn't go to college, ran Pittsburgh and Lake Erie Railroad accounting with, with no college education, just a real, a real smart guy, built his, basically built most of his house um, and just was always real into health, fitness, always looking up the latest and greatest vitamins, sending them over to me from a young age, had an organic garden before people knew what organic was. So he certainly left a, a strong imprint on me. And then my parents, um, m my mother was, was kind of the, the good cop, very loving. Uh, my father really pushed me, and I mean that in a very positive way. Um, so hard work, uh, nutrition, optimal health, and certainly sports played a huge role in my upbringing. I was involved in team sports basically every, every season of the year. I played a lot of basketball to the point where I began to hate it. Uh, <laughs> I play play no basketball now. So it, it was basically this kind of mix of of sports, athletics, health, healthy dieting, and then academics. Science was pushed really, really uh, thoroughly in my household, and I, I think partially because of my my grandfather. Um, my my dad is is a very eloquent guy, good speaker, good writer, was, was never huge into science, yet he, he pushed me really hard with science, and I'm, I'm thankful for that. And I, I think part of it, I guess, was that I was good at science at a young age and good at math, so maybe, maybe he saw that and, and pushed me. I think I was too young to understand. Uh, and then pushed me throughout high school. I didn't go to my typical public school, mm -hmm. which I was very upset about and then very happy about once I realized how amazing my private pub, private high school was and then next thing i knew he we were i was getting pushed and pushed to apply to engineering schools and somehow uh, got into mit uh, my my father actually really wanted me to go to the air force academy hmm. and i wanted to go to the air force academy and then i visited the air force academy and uh, I, was, I was supposed to play basketball there as well and realized that it was it was a great place, but probably not the, the best place for me. I, I did a summer seminar at the Naval Academy as well, where they really give you a, a taste of that. And uh, I, I just thought it wasn't the best thing for me. So my father and I had many talkless dinner table uh, conversations or lack thereof. <laughs> and, and he basically left it. I mean, he would have supported me wherever I went. Mm -hmm. But he basically left it that if you get into MIT then I'll be totally fine with you going there as opposed to the Air Force Academy. <laughs> and I was actually away in Florida on a senior trip and he said, I got a letter from MIT. And I said, is it in a big envelope or a small envelope? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and, he, yeah, and he said a big envelope. So I was pretty excited. I knew that meant I, that I got in. And from there, it was just kind of a, a springboard of, of science, uh, really questioning things. Um, took me to med school and, and after med school kind of circled right back around. I'm a, now a radiation oncologist, which is a very science tech heavy field. We, we have to do radiobiology boards and we also have to do physics boards. So in that regard, my undergraduate degree actually paid off. And um, the nice thing too is I get to do a little bit of engineering, a little bit of science, a little bit of math, and obviously the health nutrition, that whole aspect of my upbringing is, is right back at the forefront. It all ties together. That's great. What led to your decision to attend medical school specifically? It was the summer after my, I want to say freshman year of college, freshman or sophomore year of college, 
I was working on an artificial heart project. I worked on a, there were solar panels that basically would turn, pull oxygen out of, actually, sorry, these are two projects here I'm talking about. The first project I worked on was the artificial heart project where I worked on the pumping mechanism of it. Mm -hmm. The second project, all right, now it's making sense. That was after my freshman year. After my sophomore year, I worked on an artificial lung which used a laser light blasting a solar panel, which pulled water, excuse me, oxygen out of water to oxygenate the blood. You'd circulate the blood through it. Uh, really interesting project, basically using solar power to make oxygen. It eventually got an, uh, a grant to be used on submarines because you don't need an oxygen tank to provide oxygenation and also for high altitude um, air travel. And that at that point, I kind of left it uh, but anyway, when I was working in the hospital on these projects, I was interacting with patients and patients on the uh, artificial lung. And I realized I really enjoyed interacting with patients. I really enjoyed the science, but I needed to do both. So I knew I couldn't just be a, a generalist physician or I knew I couldn't just be an engineer. I needed a little bit of both. And that took me right up to my field now, radiation oncology. And so what is it that you particularly liked about oncology? What drew you to radiation oncology specifically? There's a couple things. Um, for, for those of you that don't know, the way radiation works is basically every day, this can vary, but every day, Monday through Friday, for a certain period of time, this can be four weeks for a simple breast cancer, can be eight weeks for a prostate cancer patient. And, and basically every day you give a little bit of radiation it damages the cancer cells and it damages the normal cells. And then you give the normal cells time to recover between each treatment. So you have these long treatment periods that can last weeks upon weeks. So I get to see the patients every day in my clinic. I see them at least once a week for a checkup. So you just form these relationships with people. I don't think in any other field of medicine do you see people that often in your office. And you, you see them in the hallways of the hospital and it, it really allows you to forge some interesting relationships with these people. Hmm. So that, that's the first thing. The second thing is the, to treat a cancer patient is, it, it's emotional, but it's extremely rewarding. You get these people that come in and, and all they think is that this is the end. And if you can provide them any benefit, whether that's palliation towards, towards the end or whether it, it's a cure. I mean, I see a lot of breast cancer patients and the cure rates are huge mm -hmm. and it's just so rewarding that these people come in thinking the worst and then you see them years and years down the road and, and everything's fine. So that, that's a huge part. And then the science of it is, is, I mean, we have giant linear accelerators in the back room uh, that are multi, multi-million dollar machines that we get to play with. Uh, so that, that's a, a very fun aspect of it. So if you hadn't gone into oncology, are there any other fields that you might have pursued specifically in medicine or even in science? When I started out in medical school, I assumed I was going to be a pediatrician or an orthopedic surgeon. And I think people think that often because those are two of the doctors you see when you're a kid, mm -hmm. right? Everyone sees a pediatrician. And if you're in sports, you see an orthopedic surgeon. So for me, those are the two best fields in the world. Uh, but as I advanced throughout medicine, I realized that those two, while they're great fields, were not necessarily, not necessarily my cup of tea. So what else would I have done? It, that's, a, that's a tough question. By the time I was applying for radiation oncology, in my mind, I couldn't do anything else. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, there's a lot of interesting fields. Uh, there's a lot of fields in like kinesiology, you know, me physical medicine and rehab, where they make artifice, artificial limbs. Uh, so I thought that was something I could maybe get involved with. Again, I didn't have a good backing in it. I had the science background, but I think that would probably be something that I would have, or an avenue that I would have gone down. The second edition of your book, Misguided Medicine, has recently been released. And I must tell you that this is a really nice piece of work. I enjoyed it very much, and I've, I've bought copies for, uh, for friends and family Thank members. You. Uh, we will put a link to the book uh, in the show notes, of course. Now, this book represents a substantial collection of what you regard as longstanding and potentially damaging medical myths. Let's uh, chat briefly about some of those myths now, and then we'll circle back in more detail to talk about many of them as the interview goes on. But for now, just if you could just rattle off a bunch of these medical myths. 
Sure. First off, thanks too. I'm glad you enjoy the book. Um, put a lot of time and in, in years into that. So, uh, yeah, the medical myths. So, wow, where to start? The uh, the easy one that's getting pretty well deconstructed is the whole low fat medical myth that low fat will a low fat diet will do everything from make you skinny, uh, stop your heart from or your coronary arteries from clogging, to stopping diabetes, which doesn't make a whole heck of a lot of sense to stopping cancer. Uh, a lot of science is now debunking that medical myth. Uh, the other big ones are, and these accompany the low fat diet. And in fact, the low fat diet probably led to a lot of these. Um, but the other ones are um, not eating meat, eating a low meat diet. Um, eggs are included in that to not eat eggs. Uh, decreasing the intake of salt, uh, exercising by running you know, marathons or ultra marathons as being the uh, epitome of health. Uh, staying out of the sun is a is a huge one. And while there are merits to staying out of the sun, if you're looking uh, through a polarized lens, there's a lot of health benefits of the sun that that we've just kind of ignored. Um, and then the supplement industry, while oftentimes makes a lot of sense, there's certainly the, a room or there's some room for vitamins. Or, or, or minerals or nutrients, uh, overall, you can't get in food, uh, you can't get from a pill rather, what you can get in food many times. Uh, so that's another big kind of medical myth. Uh, calcium was a, another huge one where we pushed calcium, pushed calcium, ignored the fact that a lot of the issues with coronary arteries were that calcium were clogging them, and that's what we're left with now. And then Last but not least, I touch on this very briefly at the end, and this overlaps with the whole theory of taking antioxidants, is that a little stress is not bad for you, and a little stress actually, and that's stress via exercise, food, many different things, a little stress actually causes your body to fight free radicals and make itself stronger. So it's our innate antioxidant uh, mechanism. Mm, I'm feeling strong. <laughs> <laughs> So circling back to nutrition, Colin, what do you think about the current dietary guidelines for the American public? If you were to completely change the guidelines, how would you change them and why? That is a, a great, great, great loaded, loaded question. <laughs> um, <laughs> so the guidelines currently are changing so fast and so subtly that it, it's hard to know what they're actually telling people anymore. Now, if we rewind to the food pyramid, and that's, I think everyone recognizes a food pyramid, which interesting thing, the food pyramid has been retired yet. I don't think many people would even realize that because it was so quietly done. There's the food plate now. And, and just to, to revert back, the, the food pyramid is basically the base of the pyramid is grains, bread, carbohydrates. Um, as you move up, you go to fruits and vegetables and then fats are minimized. And then at the, I think at the very top, I actually forget the very top because I rarely look at it is uh, sweets, I believe. Mm. Now that, that's been replaced with the food plate, which is, uh, again, I'm going to mess these things up because I, I don't spend much time looking at them, uh, which maybe tells you how worthwhile they are. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's about a, a fourth, I think, lean, lean proteins, uh, like there's grains in there. And then I think fruit and vegetables. And so these are very general recommendations, and I think in general, nutritional recommendations are are vague, and I think they're left vague on purpose because no one wants to say the wrong thing and the data is all over the place. And, and more recently, I guess we're pushing a Mediterranean diet, and I, I have no clue what a Mediterranean diet is, and I don't think anyone does. We'll come back to that. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, there's the other... Uh, a plant-based diet, which again, I, I don't know what that means. I eat a lot of plants. I also eat a lot of animals, um, but <laughs> it's, I wouldn't call my diet an animal-based diet. So anyway, to, to rewind here, the, the recommendations were very low fat, very high carbohydrate, and moderate protein. Mm -hmm. And some of the older recommendations, depending on what you read, they're even pushing to, I mean, you can go to Ornish or some of these other guys, and they're pushing to limit fat to less than 10% of your total intake. Um, I think that is, it's, that's, actually, that's concerning and, and probably very unsafe because um, fat is a necessary uh, macronutrient. Since uh, the, some of the other organizations have backed off on the recommendations of avoiding fat, of avoiding saturated fat, of avoiding cholesterol, 
and, and I think that's appropriate. I think they're doing it a little bit quietly because of the egregious errors in the past, but to admit though, or, or to do it more loudly to allow people to see the changes you're making, it also says that, you know, we were wrong in the past. And, you know, we could talk about this more in the future, but there's nothing wrong with, with being wrong in the past. I mm -hmm. mean, science, science is always wrong in the past, or at least less right in the past. Um, but that's tangential. But the, the best recommendations, I think, and this is what I follow, and this may not be the case for 100% of the people, but I think it's, it's very opposite of the food pyramid. I, an easy way to think about it is if you were to not eat anything for the next five days, what would your body eat? Mm -hmm. And it's a small amount of carbohydrates. That's from the glycogen in our body. And I do think the diet can include a small amount of carbohydrates. I think that's, that's probably what should vary the most based on how insulin sensitive uh, an individual is. Mm -hmm. uh, I generally eat 50 to 150 grams per day, uh, rarely over that. Some days much lower than that. Some days closer to zero, especially from fasting. STEM Talk is an educational service of the Florida Institute for Human and Machine Cognition, a not-for-profit research lab pioneering groundbreaking technologies aimed at leveraging and extending human cognition, perception, locomotion, and resilience. So Colin, salt, fat, and foods that are rich in cholesterol have long been considered boogeymen in the world of nutrition. Can you share your views on these? Sure. I, I think a lot of, well, at least the salt, and I, I've, when I first wrote an article about salt, I referred to it as collateral damage in the war against fat. So, so <laughs> if, if you read my book, you, you know where I stand on, on low fat. I'm, I'm very against it. Um, I'm, I'm very pro-fat uh, for, for many different reasons. And I think when we tell, and I think it's a normal kind of natural diet that our body is meant to process. So when we stray from mm -hmm. that, there's other issues that happen down the road. So if you reduce fat, you increase carbohydrates. And the data shows us that's exactly what has happened. The U.S. population has increased their carbohydrates. When you increase your carbohydrates, other things happen, like you have high blood sugar, you have fat that builds up in some of your organs, you get things like type 2 diabetes, that and then you have an increase in the amount of insulin circulating throughout your body, which acts on the kidneys, telling them to retain several things, including sodium. So then you tell people to restrict their sodium. And now sodium is a vital part of our health. I mean, lots of animals, elephants travel miles and miles of dangerous territory to get their salt. Humans, I mean, salt was once used as money because they know that it's a vital resource. So to put it as this, this boogeyman that, that you should restrict is illogical from an evolutionary point of view. And I know that's kind of a dangerous word to use because it depends on how you define evolutionary. Uh, it's something our body naturally runs on. And then when you look at the studies where they severely restricted salt, it was detrimental. It was dangerous. And, and that's not a surprise. It's, a, it's something we need in the diet. If you eat a normal whole food diet without a lot of processed foods and without a huge amount of carbohydrates, you actually need to increase your salt. Uh, if you work out at a gym, you really need to increase your salt. I salt load before I go to the gym. And oftentimes I salt load after. In the summertime, when it's warm out and I'm, uh, I sweat during a workout, I salt load quite a bit or else my blood pressure drops and I can get syncopal. Uh, so that's just one of the major examples of one of our recommendations kind of bled out into other issues of health. Saturated fat really followed the recommendations to avoid fat. And conceptually, it makes sense. I, I get it. I know where that came from. If you look at saturated fat at room temperature, it's, a, it's solid. If you look at a stick of butter, if you look at coconut oil, it, it's solid. And I understand why at some point looking at that would say, hmm, if I eat that and it re-solidifies in my body, that's going to gunk up my arteries. It's going to clog them. It's going to build up as fat. Unfortunately, or I guess fortunately, what we eat is not exactly incorporating what our body does with what we eat. So we're not what we eat. I think Jeff Volick maybe said this the best. We aren't what we eat. We are what our body does with what we eat. And so we don't mm -hmm. eat butter and then turn it right back into butter. 
And interestingly, when we eat carbohydrates, we actually turn them into something else. It's not necessarily just sugar. I mean, you get triglycerides, you get other things. So I understand why that happened from the beginning, but data disproved that many times over. And now it's time to kind of part our losses here and move on. One other uh, primary food boogeyman has been foods rich in cholesterol. Do you remember uh, you, eggs? I mean, even now, if you stay at a high-end hotel or something for an extra dollar, they'll take all the egg yolks out of your omelet. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, cholesterol is a v another vital nutrient. Uh, it's so vital that our body produces it, and if we stop eating it, our body produces a lot more of it. So again, it's like, let's take a step back and think about this. Uh, let's, let's take a step back and think about all the processes in our body that rely on cholesterol. And I, I'm not an expert on this. I know that Gary Taubes talked about it a lot in his book, but a lot of this relies on the laboratory techniques. And I guess they figured out how to assess cholesterol much sooner than they figured out how to assess insulin levels or things like that. So if you got a target, you're going to consistently look at that. Now, the issue with cholesterol there are epidemiologic data that show the lower your cholesterol is, the decreased risk you have of dying from a heart attack. So if you just look at that, if you take a polarizing view, you would say, let's eat less cholesterol. Let's lower your cholesterol. And, and there's some question whether eating less cholesterol actually lowers your cholesterol. That's, that's a controversial topic as well. But let's just pretend that it does. Even if it does, that may lower your risk of dying from a heart attack, but what does it do to everything else? And lo and behold, if you look at the data from other studies like the MR Fit study or these other studies where there's tens of thousands of people, it may decrease your risk of dying from a heart attack to have low cholesterol, but it doesn't decrease your risk of dying from everything else. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the numbers vary, but generally there's, there's some support from 200 to 240, which would be considered high by most physicians out there. That's your lowest risk of overall death. So my goal in life is to not die from anything, <laughs> not necessarily just to not die from a heart attack. But, you know, medicine is it's chopped up into subspecialties, and I understand why. But sometimes we need to take a step back and look at a, a bird's eye view of things. And that just hasn't been done in the cholesterol saturated fat world. And, and that's starting to happen now. There's been meta-analyses, and I know they have their issues, but there's been meta-analyses and other studies that have been showing that a lot of these, these dangers or harms have been over overblown and then even the Framingham study and some of these older studies they just failed miserably with regards to the cholesterol recommendations and saturated fat and that just wasn't published late last year an organization with the rather orwellian name of the world health organization released a report which reviewed the putative link between red meat and cancer this report of course sparked a media frenzy about the hazards of red meat in particular, the report categorized processed meat, which is a very broad range of products, as absolutely carcinogenic to humans, lumping it in the same category as smoking and arsenic. Meanwhile, unprocessed red meat was placed in the second to worst category, labeled probably carcinogenic, in which red meat joined alleged nutritional ne'er-do-wells such as lead and the human papillomavirus, petroleum, and anabolic steroids. This report and the uncritical reporting that followed has engendered much confusion. I wonder if you would talk briefly about this report and then delve directly into the primary issue at hand, that is the status of red meat with respect to cancer risk. So I think, I'm not sure what ticked me off more about that study, the well, it's not even a study. As you said, it's a report, um, which kind of ticked me off because everyone, all the media discussed it as a study. So it was either that or the 30,000 emails that I had the next day waiting for me in my <laughs> inbox yeah, asking the, me. <laughs> the same asking, thing happened here. <laughs> yeah, I I exactly. So there, there's a quite a mix of data on the benefits and dangers of meat and red meat and processed meat and all these other types of animal products. So there are so many things to pick at here. Uh, I'll, I'll just start with a basic. And a lot of these studies group red meat in with hot dogs, corned beef, and other meats. Um, so the problem is you're getting processed meats and unprocessed meats in the same study. That's the first issue. 
Second issue is when people are eating hot dogs, corned beef, and all these other things, they're eating them wrapped around a bun. So we're not considering that. Uh, then the issue is, it depends on where you go. I mean, you, you can stop at my house and look how I eat red meat. So I usually marinate it, um, do other things to decrease the, the amount of nitrosamines that are built up when you cook. And then you go to my neighbor who chars it black out back in his grill, which you know is carcinogenic. And so you're blaming it on the red meat, but it's not the red meat in itself that's doing it. It's the process of cooking the red meat. Uh, that being said, the data is still pretty dicey overall. And I, I heard a great uh, analogy. I think it was from the diet doctor, his website. And he said uh, he had a study or report that plants cause one in four cancer. And he went on and on. And the point of it was that tobacco, which is a plant, is what causes lung cancer in 25% of cancers out there. And it sounds silly, but it's not the plant that's doing it. It's all the other junk that's put in there. And it's also the, the act of burning it and inhaling it. Uh, just like we know vegetable oils, when they're burned on a stove, can release acrolein, and that can cause lung cancer and can cause a mutation in young Asian women that we're starting to see in the clinic. Uh, it's not the oil itself. It's the burning of the oil. Though the oil itself can cause some other issues, but I'm getting tangential now. But back to the issue with meat, so all those issues aside, we're still talking about a nutrient-dense resource here that our body uses to function and grow. So comparing it with petroleum or lead or these other things is just, it's, it's silly. This is food. And as a guy that I like, Ionitis, published in this paper, all, food, all foods cause or cure you from cancer. And that's been shown in a ton of studies. So if we wanna start picking through foods and the dangers that they could have, every food can be dangerous to some degree. However, we need to eat food to survive. So we need to be smart about which foods we put on our mouth and which foods we don't. The processing of the foods is a whole nother issue. And then the final issue of this is when you tell people not to eat one thing, they're gonna eat other things. And I don't know, it, it seems like we're just never gonna learn this lesson, but you know, you tell people not to eat fat, and then they eat a ton of carbohydrates. They eat Coke. I remember being at basketball games when I was a kid and the candy stand, everyone eating the candy because there was no fat in it. So they thought it was good for you. Mm -hmm. You're going to see the same thing here with red meat. And let's say if you look through all those studies, the biggest risk of red meat causing cancer, the overall increase of risk is like less than 1% in the general population. Let's say that is true. I would take that increased risk over people not eating it and eating a bunch of other terrible foods like sugar and carbohydrates and, 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 and access that we know can cause other issues that can cause cancer. So again, these are, these are balances. And anytime you look at things with a polarized view, you get people into trouble. Absolutely. So speaking of polarized views, <laughs> I'm going to take the hit on this one. So I've actually been a vegetarian for 21 years. Okay. And I've actually been talking to Dominic D'Agostino about working on a, a ketogenic diet that's specific for vegetarians. And so mm -hmm. we're trying to piece that together. What's your advice for vegetarians like myself who might be interested in the ketogenic diet? That is a great question. <laughs> I have two very close friends that are Hindu and they are vegetarians and they've been asking me that for years. So I, I wrote, a, I wrote a couple articles on it. it it's difficult. It's certainly difficult. Um, you have to lean more on like macadamia nuts and coconut oil. I know Dominic does a lot of the MCT oil or MCT products, and, and those are, of course, um, compatible with a vegetarian diet. Um, if, if dairy is allowed, it helps out tremendously because mm -hmm. there's you know full fat uh, dairy sources, um, butter, et cetera. The, the real thing where you're missing out at times, or excuse me, the real thing where you're not missing out is the protein because you don't need a lot of protein. And that's often a concern of vegetarians. And I think that it need not be one. Uh, then the other question is just how do you get extra fat in, of course, and eggs can fit in that part as well. Uh, unfortunately, you probably have to turn a little towards some of the oil. So, you know, I think we would, I think Dominic and I would generally agree. I don't want to speak for him, but these would be uh, the safer oils like avocado oil, coconut oil, olive oil, macadamia nut oil, avocado oil, and palm oil. Uh, and again, the, the MCT aspect in itself or with coconut oils is a good place to go. 
Um, but one of the key things here is without dairy, I'm, I'm not sure it would be pretty darn hard. Yeah, I agree. Well, the the good part is, is I have the dairy part covered, so okay. <laughs> so that makes right. it a lot easier. But still, it's it's a it's a work in progress. <laughs> I, I, I think uh, you'll hit it over the fence. Yeah, I, I, you know, you include dairy and egg, so you know, egg yolk and avocado and dairy, you should be good. Yeah. Thanks, Colin. I would, absolutely. I, I would love for you guys to complete that project because then it will take some work off, off my back. So. Okay. Well, we're working on it. <laughs> we'll Great. keep you in the loop on that. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so actually, talking about our personal diets, tell us a little bit more about your own personal diet. So you've talked about salt loading before you work out, and then you've talked about um, you know, about marinating meat. Uh, just Can you give us kind of a, a perspective on what you eat on a daily basis? Sure. Um, I guess generally speaking, um, my, my diet's timing of food and, and fasting and those things are quite flexible. Um, I generally eat around 50 to 150 grams of carbohydrates a day. And that, that's very rough, roughly speaking. I rarely go over that, um, but oftentimes I go well under it, especially if I'm fasting or if I'm dipping into a period of ketosis. Uh, my, my diet is very fat heavy uh, and what I consider healthy fats. And that means no, I try to lim eliminate processed type foods and processed fats. Um, and I, I cook a lot. Cooking for me is, is like meditation. And I think if you don't cook, it's pretty hard to eat a healthy diet. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess, unless you're extremely wealthy and have a chef. Um, but I, I don't have either of those, nor, nor would I want to have the chef part. I'll take the extremely wealthy part. Uh, <laughs> but um, so I, I guess basically to take you through my day for breakfast, I either have one of my several types of, of bone broths that I make. It's a, I'm Southern Italian and, and it's kind of in my roots. So I'll make some of those with marrow bones, put in some spinach, uh, bok choy, and then a bunch of pastured eggs. And by pastured, I don't mean pasteurized. I mean, eggs that run around eating bugs and other things, or, or excuse me, chickens that run around eating <laughs> bugs and, and other things. Those are frisky <laughs> eggs. <laughs> and, so, uh, or I'll- Get some I'll, of those. Yeah, yeah. Or I'll make a, uh, an omelet or some kind of eggs in the morning with some kind of vegetable and then maybe even a little bit of cheese. Uh, and then I'll have some tea after that. And then for lunch, I usually eat uh, a large source of a vegetable, whether that's Brussels sprouts, broccoli, uh, kale, so, so usually a green leafy vegetable, plus maybe some type of cauliflower or something like that. And then on that, I usually have it cooked in some kind of fat source, whether that's ghee, which is clarified butter, or just general grass-fed butter, or any of those oils I mentioned, or um, I'll douse it in olive oil. And I usually have some kind of meat source added in, whether that's shrimp, salmon, cod, uh, squid, octopus. Um, I like a lot of organ meats, so stomach, or I like jaw, which is like the cheek part. Um, Sorry if I'm grossing you out. No, um, all good. Okay. And, <laughs> Ken's and stomach is rumbling right now. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like my diet. <laughs> and, and it's it's certainly enough food that, that really fills me up and I'm not hungry throughout the day. And then for dinner, I have something along the same lines as lunch, uh, but I mix it up. Last night I had feta cheese wrapped uh, lamb meatballs with Brussels sprouts cooked in butter, a uh, morsel of dark chocolate, and a, a glass of red wine. And my, my cheat, if I want to cheat at night, it's usually uh, some kind of nice unpasteurized cheese or some dark chocolate or some wine. Perfect. So let's move away from nutrition. We've talked a lot about food, and I think we're all getting a little bit hungry for lunch now. <laughs> your book includes your thoughts on exercise. What sort of exercise do you favor and why? Uh, my, yeah, so this is the area that seems to, to get me into the most amount of trouble. <laughs> uh, so I, I think exercise is obviously very good for everyone. I think high levels of background activity are vital. And by that, I mean lots of walking, lots of movement, lots of standing. I think people in offices should have at least a part-time standing desk. Uh, I think activity trackers are great for those kind of things. So I think people should take, I don't know how many miles or steps per day, but I generally try to do at least three to five miles of background activity per day. And then I think people should cycle in some sort of safe but intense exercise in between. And, and this is very dependent on the person. So my mix is I do martial arts um, usually once or twice per week. 
And then I lift weights at the gym, usually three or four times per week. And then in between, I'll do some kind of other random activity. And, and I think the, the difference is that low level activity is, is very good for burning fat and just for staying mentally fit and staying physically fit. The high intensity activities are great for stimulating muscle growth, stimulating your mitochondria and improving your overall metabolic function. Now, what I don't do is the grinded out exercise that's in between. Uh, and I, I don't think that that's healthy. So I'm not a fan of long distance running. And that being said, I understand that it provides a benefit for some people. I understand it provides a mental benefit. Uh, it's therapeutic for people, and I'm not commenting on that. I just think overall, from a health point of view, it, it wears and tears your joints, and it wears and tears the heart. And there's more and more studies coming out on the damage it does to the heart. And I got to say, I'm, I'm biased because I have some very close personal friends, family friends, and others who have run their whole lives. And now they have a lot of heart issues and I'm seeing it more and more. And it's really tough to swallow. Now, this is something that when I bring up, I get utterly lambasted on Twitter or Facebook or these other places. And that, that chapter in my book is what most people comment to me angrily about. And again, there are therapeutic benefits mentally, but the physical benefits, I think the other types of exercise, if you can do that instead, are much better in the grand scheme of things. I concur. If you think about it, uh, and you clearly have, uh, jogging in particular seems like a very odd exercise and potentially, as you noted, harmful. You know, yep. One can visit any major metropolitan city on a sunny day and see literally thousands of people jogging about. And should a person of even a couple generations back be somehow magically teleported into modern times, they would wonder, why are all these people running? Maybe somebody is chasing them. <laughs> and why do they run so slowly then? <laughs> and, and why do they look so unhappy? And, they, and, and uh, you know, our visitor from times long ago would be completely flummoxed by this sight. Now, there's Absolutely. much else about the modern world that would flummox them. But <laughs> when, we, when we compare the relative levels of fitness between that time and this time, uh, we might want to think twice about that form of exercise. Yes, a amen. So Colin, the entire issue of sun exposure, cancer, and human health is rife with confusion and conflicting advice. Please share your current thinking on this topic. I think the views on the sun Ca causing cancer. And, and, and we can go back to the, the food study I mentioned, like er everything basically causes or, or cures cancer to some degree based on the, the study. Well, the sun is, is no different. And there's certainly studies that link the sun with skin cancers like basal cell carcinomas, squamous cell carcinoma, and melanoma has been a little more elusive um, with studies kind of all over the place. But for the sake of the argument, let's just assume it increases all three. And on a polar, looking at a polarized lens, we would say, all right, we need to stay out of the sun so we can decrease the risk of basal cell, squamous cell, cancer, or melanoma. Again, assuming it, it strongly causes melanoma. So the issue with that from the start is basal cell and squamous cell, basal cell especially, are almost, basal cells are almost non-cancerous. Mm -hmm. You can resect them. You, sometimes they do need radiation. I'm not minimizing them, um, but they're not as severe in the terms of the cancer spectrum as other cancers. Melanoma, on the other hand, is they can be a bad player. Their melanoma is extremely rare. So the next question is, what good does the sun play? And the good that the sun plays is basically it reduces the risk of nearly every other cancer. So cancers like breast cancer that one in eight women get prostate cancer that a vast, it's a, the major cancer that men get. Uh, there's even some studies with lung cancer, which is one of the biggest killers, colon cancer. It decreases the risk of all these much more common, or it's at least associated with a decreased risk of much more common cancers, much more deadly cancers. So the question is, do you really want to stay out of the sun? The other question then is, what other benefits does the sun have? If the sun's that bad, how the heck are we even alive here millions of years on this earth? getting blasted with it day in and day out. Well, not day out, but just day in. Um, so the, the other benefits 
are that it makes your bones stronger because it causes vitamin D production in your skin. There's some data that there's other things going on that we don't even know about. People's blood pressure dropping, potentially nitric oxide secretion from exposure. There's all these different benefits. And that's what happens, again, I know I'm beating a dead horse here. When we take a polarized view, we forget the other aspects of these things. So vitamin D pulls calcium into our bones. It helps our immune system. It helps to fight cancer, which is probably one of the major reasons why if you get sun, you have a better immune system and you can fight cancer. It's also with the bones, it's a reason why a lot of these countries where they've been slapping on sunblock and staying out of the sun, fracture risks have gone up. So um, I wouldn't go as far as to say there's no risk from going on the sun because I certainly think there is. I think it's a small one and I think the benefit outweighs the risk. That being said, much like red meat, we need to be smart about it. You don't want to eat a burnt charcoaled piece of red meat. You don't want to sit out in the sun and fry yourself. Uh, I like, um, gosh, I'm totally blanking on his name. He gave a talk at IHMC. He's a vitamin D specialist. Oh, Michael Uh, Hollick. Michael Hollick, yes. Very, very down to earth, very scientific and very smart in his approach to vitamin D. He says to go outside as long as it takes to get a sunburn, just cut that in half. And he suggests you get sun exposure to many areas of your body, not just your face, because you can get photo damage on the face. And when you get older, you don't look as good. And we all want to look, look good in society. So, so I, I think we have to have a smart way to do it. And I don't think you should go out in the sun and throw a bunch of sunblock on and think you're safe from the issues with it. The benefits of the sun doesn't mean you need to sit there and fry away in it. You can just get a small amount. The other thing that not slopping on a ton of sunblock does is it makes you go in and out of the sun because if you're still trying to avoid sunburn, you'll be cognizant of that fact. And I found personally that when I don't use a sunblock, but I still try to limit my limit too much sun, that I end up doing a much better job at it. So again, it has to be a balance of, of kind of smart and science. Hmm, absolutely. Well, think shifting gears a little bit here. We now turn to cancer therapy and especially ketogenic diets and potentially ketone esters as part of a multifaceted cancer therapy. In your 2015 paper with Clement, you summarized a large body of evidence showing that a ketogenic diet activates the same molecular mechanisms that are targeted separately by anti-cancer drugs and may in fact act synergistically with both radiation and chemotherapy. And I wondered if you could elaborate on this a little. Sure. Uh, so the, the ketogenic diet, which I think we've, we've touched on a bit, but basically it's a very high fat, low carbohydrate, moderately low protein diet. It, it, it flicks a couple switches uh, metabolically that can help you do a couple things like burn fat, lose weight. It lowers insulin. Uh, it may lower blood glucose, not necessarily in the the healthy person, but someone who generally has a higher glucose than they should, it will lower it. Uh, And it does a couple other things like lower inflammation. And metabolically speaking, some of these pathways, like you said, are the same ones we're targeting. So there's, there's drugs now that try to decrease insulin or block insulin. People are using metformin in, in clinical trials. There's a lung cancer, lung cancer trial right now with radiation where they're giving metformin. Metformin lowers blood glucose levels and can lower insulin levels. So many of these different pathways, you can do the same thing, thing through diet alone. And the benefit of that is obviously it's, it's a diet, it's a lifestyle change. There's really minimal side effects. You're not taking an expensive drug that may have more side effects. And, and also it gets patients involved in their care. And I think this might be one of the most underestimated but largest benefits of this. So instead of a, a guy coming in and me saying, I'm gonna blast you with radiation, we're gonna blast you with chemo, and there's not much you can do about it. Now, patients can take their health into their own hands to some degree. Now, in animal studies, there has, it has been shown that it synergizes with radiation. There's a great study from Adrienne Sheck and her group out in Barrow in Arizona showing that radiation and a ketogenic diet alone cause nine out of, I think it's nine out of 11 mice to basically be found brain tumorless after they had a growing glioma in their brain. And that data was so compelling that she now has a clinical trial that I think is halfway accrued uh, at Barrow. And uh, others are trying to to look at the diet for others. Uh, Rainer Clement, who you mentioned in that study with me, he has a 
protocol going on where they're doing fasting and uh, the ketogenic diet. And I think there's one other arm, which may, might be both uh, for several different types of cancer patients, including uh, breast cancer patients. So I think, um, I think it's going to be thoroughly answered whether a ketogenic diet in itself synergizes with any of these treatments. Uh, the intriguing thing about the ketogenic diet, I don't want to get ahead of myself here, is that as metabolic therapies come out, uh, and I don't mean like metformin, I mean more intense metabolic therapies that lower your blood glucose or block some of these vital metabolic pathways, a ketogenic diet may provide an escape mechanism to fuel our normal cells. Mm -hmm. And there's there's no trials that I know of testing that right now. I'm trying to get one up and rolling, but it's it's challenging to get these studies through. But I think the future holds something along those lines. Absolutely. Very, very interesting and quite promising. In Absolutely. your uh, 2013 paper, uh, which I, by the way, enjoyed uh, quite a bit with Simone et al., it was titled, uh, I might be messing this up, but Selectively Starving Cancer Cells mm -hmm. Through Dietary Manipulation. And, and you compared uh, calorie restriction, intermittent fasting, and ketogenic diets across a range of serum markers and also considered practical matters such as adherence, uh, just the ability of the person to, uh, to do the diets. And um, the, although the choice of diet while undergoing cancer therapy may turn out to be somewhat cancer subtype dependent, as was mentioned in the paper, it would seem that under many circumstances, strong consideration should be given to the ketogenic diet and or ketone supplementation, even in comparison to the other two as part of a treatment regime. Could you elaborate on why that might be the case? Sure, um, and just funny funny background on that paper. Um, so the, the, the first author, Simone, the, the senior author, the, the PI was uh, Nikki Simone, and they're unrelated, but she was a, a great mentor to me during residency. She's very smart, she really pushed me along with my uh, dietary views. Uh, one area where we did not agree, she was a fan of calorie restriction. And this paper was published on the heels of a study that we did showing 30% calorie restriction in mice in a breast cancer model synergized with radiation. Uh, the, the issue with calorie restriction in mice is that a 30% reduction of their chow, which is mostly carbohydrates, begs the question is, is it carbohydrate restriction or is it calorie restriction? So that kind of, we went back and forth uh, quite a bit. I don't want to say arguing, I guess intellectually arguing over these things and which would be better for patients. Now, 30% calorie restriction for a cancer patient is very difficult. And I think most people would have trouble with that. Uh, intermittent fasting is probably a little bit easier uh, because you can just go a certain amount of time without any food and then you get to eat during the vast majority of the time. The ketogenic diet, however, elicits similar metabolic changes and similar cellular changes as both of these states without patients having to fast or necessarily restrict their calories, though that's a controversial area. So it, I've heard it discussed as kind of like a hack. It's like a calorie restriction hack because, again, you can eat all the time without, with getting these same benefits without having to restrict as long as you keep the calories low. And so that's what this paper kind of discusses. And then the other question, of course, is, is it about the metabolic changes or is it about ketones in themselves uh, that elicit the, the big difference here? And I think it's probably both. Um, so the question is though, if, if ketones do provide some benefit and someone can't do any dietary changes, can giving exogenous ketones in themselves make a difference. And, and I know Dominic D'Agostino is trying to answer that question among other people. The nice thing about it is if both matter, which again, I think they probably do, ketones, taking ketones will make the ketogenic diet easier. It'll make it easier following it. And, and, and to kind of circle back around, maybe that's the, the cheat that you guys need on your vegetarian ketogenic diet. Maybe that'll be the way to, to make it easier. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we're, we're, Don would be one of the... Uh, the early uh, uh, human test subjects, I have, <laughs> there, I have no doubt. <laughs> there you go. There you go. And, you know, when you look at the diet in the context of cancer, a ketogenic diet strongly activates AMPK 
and really substantially downregulates IGF-1. Mm -hmm. And you wonder, both of those are probably having a, a positive effect there. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's making the changes that we try to make with drugs. So we, we really need to start testing it so that uh, the the non-believers will at least give it a try. But, you know, these dietary studies are just so hard to do. Absolutely. This got to be. STEM Talk is an educational service of the Florida Institute for Human and Machine Cognition, a not-for-profit research lab pioneering groundbreaking technologies aimed at leveraging and extending human cognition, perception, locomotion, and resilience. In uh, 2010, uh, Bonicelli uh, et al. published a paper titled Ketones and Lactate Fuel Tumor Growth in Metastasis, Evidence that Epithelial Cancer Cells Use Oxidative Mitochondrial Mechanism. And in this paper, they conclude that ketones and lactate, in particular, fuel tumor growth in metastasis. And the authors make the following concluding remark. Finally, Given our current findings that ketones increase tumor growth, cancer patients and their dietitians may want to reconsider the use of a ketogenic diet as a form of anti-cancer therapy. Although we might be able to guess, could you please share your <laughs> views on this topic? Well, the, the most interesting thing about that whole paper is that around that same time, I wrote a paper called Nutrient Restriction and Radiation Therapy When Less is More. <laughs> and, and the whole point of that paper was that calorie restriction or fasting can reduce the risk of developing cancer and synergize with radiation. And one of the points I made in there was if you look back through the older studies, they're really, really talking about restricting carbohydrates, not calories. And one of the authors on that paper with me is actually the senior author on the paper you just talked mm. about. He was at my institution. Um, so that paper had... They had some good points, and then they had some questionable points. I know uh, Seafried wrote a response quoting the plethora of data against what they're saying, and they refused to publish it in that journal. I can't remember what it was, Cell, cell Cycle or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was it. Yeah. Um, the other problem is, and this goes back to what's in my book, um, one, one study in a modified tumor cell line doesn't prove anything. So to make the comment from that to that dietitian should be reconsidering whether they do a ketogenic diet, uh, that, that's inappropriate. And that's how we as physicians and physician scientists get ourselves into mm -hmm. trouble. Uh, lastly, let's say that is true. Let's say that ketones can feed cancer cells. There's a couple issues here. We, we just talked about all the metabolic changes that occur during a ketogenic diet. So regardless of whether the ketones can feed cancer cells or not, and again, there's much data showing they can't. There's actually a study that came out recently showing they can, but maybe it's all the metabolic changes. And so it's still more beneficial to go on a ketogenic diet. The other question is, we know the issues with sugar and having high blood glucose levels and all these other things and how it can feed cancer. So going back to the everything causes or cures cancer, what's your solution then? Do you want us to put all patients on a high carbohydrate diet? because we know that that's probably a lot worse. So again, comments like that and data like that, I, I like every paper out there I like because it gets us closer to the answer, whether it supports my view or goes directly against it. But we can't make bold statements no. like that after the fact. And, and how many papers have we seen showing similar conclusions? Not many. No, and those mice were very special mice. They were, they were very special mice, exactly. So we're taking special mice and telling humans that they should change what they're doing based on these special mice. Yeah, I strongly agree. It's uh, one way to reduce oxidative stress and the damage from reactive oxygen species is to halt respiration. Mm -hmm. Of course, that would halt everything else. <laughs> <laughs> and, and just one final point, like my, my study, for instance, that I'm that's going to the IRB is doing this in patients with glioblastoma. And, you know, maybe it, and, and that's what Adrian Sheck's doing, and maybe it doesn't work, and that's fine. Then we'll look for something else, but that's science. We gotta continually question things. The survival right now for patients with GBM 
is, is about 15 to 17 months, and that's not satisfactory. So maybe this doesn't work, but it sure is heck worth a try. Right. We had, we had a front long-term colleague here uh, uh, who was getting care for GBM at one of the most famous places. And uh, uh, when I talked to his physician, uh, the doc was aghast at the notion that the diet would involve him eating high fat, because after all, it's he thought it wasn't good for his heart. <laughs> yeah, this, this just boggled my mind. Yeah, because that that's a primary concern right now. Mm -hmm. Besides the fact that it's even wrong, but yeah, yeah. we yeah, you, I, I didn't yeah, even yeah. want to get into that. It was wrong. I it's, it's just I was Big flum <laughs> flummoxed. Yeah, at what this guy was missing about the threat to my friend's life it wasn't heart disease. Yeah, little little yeah. short sighted. Well, you. We've talked about it earlier, and you've written that AMPK is the antithesis of cancer, and indeed AMPK is of great interest these days. As mentioned earlier, a ketogenic diet strongly activates AMPK, as does the aforementioned uh, drug, metformin. And could you talk a little bit about AMPK in the context of cancer and why activating AMPK can be beneficial in this context? Sure. There's, there's two major reasons the way I see it that AMP kinase activation can help. It downregulates this thing called mTOR. And mTOR is one of these pathways that basically tells cells to grow, tells cancer cells to grow. We have thousand, multi-thousand dollar drugs like rapamycin and some of these other similar drugs that try to block mTOR. So activating AMP kinase is one way to just block mTOR. So looking at it from strictly a pathway view, that's one thing that makes sense. The next is, is back to the kind of metabolic puzzle. When you activate AMP kinase, it switches all these different aspects of our metabolism to make them an anti-cancer uh, phenotype, basically. So it pulls blood glucose from our, excuse me, pulls sugar from our blood. So again, think of like the intense activity that we talked about, intense muscle stimulation. AMP kinase is, is basically turned on and it's telling our body that uh -oh, we're, we're burning some things now. So we need to burn glucose. We need to pull it out of the, pull it out of the blood. We need to not make any glycogen. Uh, we need to burn some cholesterol. We need to burn some fat. We need to upregulate our mitochondria. We need to do some mitochondrial biogenesis because if these mitochondria are pumping away, we need them to be better. We need to have more mitochondria. Uh, there's, uh, tangentially speaking here for a second, there's a lot of data that mitochondria, at least preclinical data, that mitochondria themselves may help fight cancer and do other things. They help clean out our cells. So you're, pull, you're putting on the body in this metabolic state that's basically saying we're breaking down right now to get some energy. We don't want to grow. Whereas you have cancer cells that are basically saying, hey, we want to grow. We want to make some biomass. So you're, you're putting your your body in basically an anti-cancer type state. The, the question is, can doing that during chemotherapy or radiation or just general cancer treatment, once the cancer is already there, help? And I think it probably can. But then the other question I think that's probably more pertinent is can enhancing that when you don't have cancer help stopping you from getting cancer? And I think that's where the data is probably gonna be stronger. It's, mm -hmm. it's things that are, you know, we rarely test prevention, but kind of looking at everything from a bird's eye view, to me, that makes quite a bit of sense. And if you look at populations that generally do activities that stimulate AMP kinase, they generally look like they do have lower amounts of cancer. So that would be my bet. Again, I don't know how we can ever prove that. That makes good sense. And it's um, a nice ex explanation. When we look at, at elevated levels of mTOR, you know, when you go to the gym and lift weights, you're elevated mTOR, mm -hmm. but you're elevated acutely and uh, episodically. And I think there's this uh, wonderful trade-off between chronic elevation of a great number of things and tissue-specific elevation of a great number of things that are essentially anabolic that we want to elevate to avoid sarcopenia, but we don't want them elevated all the time. And, you, you know, you can look at IGF-1 is in one of them and uh, mTOR is one of them. And, you know, there's a whole passel of these. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that's a good point that a lot of these pathways, a lot of these hormones, these are not zero and one equations. There's, these are normal hormones in our body, just like insulin. 
you don't want it to be zero. That would be fatal. You just don't want it to be too high because it can feed cancer cells. You know, AMP kinase, mTOR, a lot of these things are the same. So if one study comes out showing that maybe there's not a benefit from mTOR or from AMP kinase activation, that doesn't mean we throw the baby out with the bathwater. Mm-hmm. Great. So, Colin, a good friend and former Duke colleague of mine, Dr. El- Allison Betoff, uh, has been studying the effects of aerobic exercise on reducing breast tumor growth, vasculature, and also its synergistic effect with cyclophosphamide chemotherapy. Her results have been really impressive and really drive home the importance of movement during cancer treatment. Along those same lines, you recently published a paper looking at the positive effects of exercise and prostate cancer treatment. So why have these modes of you know, natural adjunctive treatment not been looked at in the, in the past? And what are we learning when it comes to mechanism of how exercise can be integrated into a cancer therapy regimen? There, there's several issues as to why they haven't happened. Um, studies need funded, and all clinical studies are extremely expensive. Like per patient, you have to pay X amount of dollars because someone's monitoring everything. So there's a lot of safety mechanisms, et cetera. So when you're testing a drug from a pharmaceutical company that may make millions of dollars from it, they have a financial onus there to invest in the trial. When it's an exercise study, there's really not many people to benefit. So no one's really funding it. So that's kind of the first roadblock. Uh, Second, and and this goes with dietary studies too, they're they're no different. Uh, Secondly, it's a lot of manpower to run these studies. It's a lot of manpower to track it. And then it's very difficult to track. Like you don't know what people are actually doing. Mm-hmm. If you bring them, you said your friend's at Duke? Uh, she was at Duke and she's up at um, Mass Gen now. Okay. So yeah, Duke, they had the, I think the Jones Lab, which I think is now at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Which is who she did her PhD with actually. Oh, awesome. Yep, yep. <laughs> with he, Lee Jones. He, he's awesome. Um, So yeah, so if you have a study where you're bringing people in and making them exercise in front of you, putting them on the treadmill, those kind of things, which I think they did do there, you can get the data. That's very, very expensive. You have to get grants and those kind of things. So that's why there's been a delay. Uh, I think the tides are going to be turning now that there's so many devices at home that can do all these things. Um, We we just finished, uh, that's the point of that paper I wrote. Uh, We just finished a breast cancer trial. We have a prostate cancer trial almost done. Then we have two other cancer trials that I'm running where we're giving patients uh, misfit activity trackers and then tracking their sleep and their activity levels before, during, and after radiation therapy. And it's giving us concrete data as to how much things change from treatment alone. And this is, I mean, it's so simple, but this is stuff that we just never had before because we had no way of tracking it. Mm -hmm. And now we have heart rate variability. We have, I mean, my, my prediction is we'll one day take patients' heart rate variability, and if it's, if it's low, they won't get chemo that day or they won't get treatment that day. Um, but these are, these are things we couldn't do in the past. So things have just been delayed. And then part of it too is, you know, cancer is a beast. And for those of us that have seen it grow through 60 gray of radiation concurrently with, with Temodar or chemotherapy, it's, it's scary and it makes you jaded and it makes you think that if someone says exercise is going to fight cancer, you want to roll your eyes. Or if someone says diet is going to help fight cancer, you think no way. And, and, and I, I understand where that comes from. I don't agree with it. Um, but I think that viewpoint, I see that in a lot of physicians. And I think data like your friends and data like that Lee Jones is producing is starting to change people's minds. And now everyone's like, hey, they're not jaded anymore. They're like, this is awesome. If, if, if exercise can do that, I mean, there's just a paper about fasting 13 hours a night. It may improve breast cancer outcomes. I mean, we're in this game to improve people's lives and to cure them from cancer. So if anything shows it, even if it questions our egos as physicians, we have to take it seriously. And I think that we're going to see a lot more of that. Absolutely. I think it's really interesting, too, the shift away from before you were told to not exercise (laughs) and to rest and the focus on rest. But now this kind of more evidence pointing towards movement and just getting out. And even if it's kind of low grade, aerobic activity is better than nothing at all. Yeah, that's a it's a great point that it's the time of the active patient, both physically and in their own care and with diet. That's another reason why the ketogenic diet is great. It allows patients 
to take charge of their health. Absolutely. So let's move away from cancer. And tell us about your website called The Caveman Doctor. <laughs> uh, so, um, wow. So yeah, I actually have a new one. It's just my name. But um, I, I started Caveman Doctor when I was a resident, when I was scared to death of making any ripples. <laughs> And the, I didn't even put my name with it for the first, I don't know how long, maybe, maybe years. But um, the, the point of it was to look at the whole medical and health system from a historical point of view. So evolutionary, kind of culturally, uh, common sense wise, and then just kind of go back through the science. And also to make it very simple for people to understand. So I love science and I love doing clinical trials and those kind of things, but really my goal is to just get the average person healthier, mm -hmm. and whether that's preventing cancer, treating cancer, et cetera. And so that was the goal of the website to make it kind of tongue in cheek, silly, funny, but also while people were entertained, kind of hit them with a lot of science to, to try to get their knowledge base up. Um, and eventually it got bigger and bigger. I think there's like five, around 5 million uh, visitors. Now, um, I've since started a website w with my name, so I'm now less scared. Uh, and it's again, it's really just to get the science, make it digestible for the, the common person. And if I put references at the end, so if they want to dig in a little deeper, they're more than welcome to do that. That's a great resource. And you've also authored some very interesting articles on HealthWire. Your most recent one was on insects as the next superfood. Can you talk about this? <laughs> sure. So I have a lot of issues with how our health is dictated by cultural and societal norms. And a lot of these cultural and societal norms have really good backing as to why they exist. And a lot of them have really bad backing as to why they exist. Mm -hmm. So the cuts of meat that we eat, that, that are dictated by society don't necessarily make sense. A lot of it's because of the low fat recommendations, but you know, we're eating the leanest cut of meat where the vitamins and other things are in some of the fattier cuts of meat or in the liver or in the organ meats or those kind of things. And to think about eating those is crazy for people for no other reason than that's how we were raised. And to think about eating insects is crazy as well, but a heck of a lot of people do it around the world and all of our ancestors did it. So why is it that crazy? Why is it okay to eat a chicken breast or a beef butt, but then not to eat an insect or to eat the cheek of a, of a cow? Mm -hmm. So really, I'm just trying to get people's minds open a little bit to, to questioning their food narratives, like what foods are healthy, what are not, what foods are okay to eat. I mean, eating an insect sounds a whole heck of a lot less psychotic than eating a packaged chemical-laden... <laughs> piece of junk that's not even food. And so that, that was a, the point of that article. It also it, it makes it interesting for people that have looked back to say, what did we traditionally eat? Oftentimes they did not include the fact that we ate a lot of insects. Yeah. Um, so there's another HealthWire, sorry, there's another HealthWire article um, that has the provocative title, is exercise making you fat? Can you explain what you mean? Sh sure. Uh, that that article was was hitting on couple things you can't exercise off calories so if you're having a if you're eating a bad diet you can exercise all you want you're not going to be healthy mm -hmm. diet's more important secondly if you don't exercise the right way and and dr ford getting back to what you were saying you know if you just kind of low level run pound your knees a bit for a couple hours a day that actually makes you a lot hungrier so if you're not eating the right kind of food exercising may actually make you less healthy. It may actually make you, you fatter. Um, my, my view is it's, it's a hydra. There's you know, m many heads of, that make you healthy and you gotta take control of all of them. And if you think you're gonna exercise some of those other heads, uh, the, 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 the lack of health away, it's, it's just not gonna work. And that was what, what I was trying to get through with that article. I have to kind of put catchy titles in or, or people don't read the articles. I've, <laughs> I've, I've written some articles that I thought were so amazing, but the title was boring and no one reads it. So <laughs> I thought that was eye-catching. Clickbait. <laughs> yeah, what they yeah call exactly. <laughs> but there's actual <laughs> substance there. That's the difference. <laughs> well, th thank you. So your book, Misguided Medicine, questions received wisdom and 
skewers some sacred cows, so to speak. This is coming from the vegetarian. (laughs) (laughs) Um, When thinking about science, it is important to appreciate that scientific method does not move toward truth via consensus. Very little in your book represents current consensus. Please share your views on the importance of being willing to question dominant narratives. Absolutely. So the most important thing for really anyone out there, but especially scientists, I see it as kind of a a, a three-step process. So you got to question things first. You got to figure out the answers. That's the second part. And then the third part is how do you implement those answers? whether that's in your personal life or teaching others or advising patients. So more often than not in medical school, even college, some uh, general higher education, we avoid number one or even number two and just go straight to number three. This is what you should tell patients and this is why. And if you start to question things, we're really taught not to question things. And people get scared when you do it. Again, with my book, I get, I get angry angry emails. And I don't know why people are so angry. I'm just posing questions, but you can't have the answers without questioning it. And what happens is one or two people question it originally. They come to their answers. We take those answers as, uh, as fact. And then next thing you know, biblical, they're, they're religious basically following of these these questions that were answered maybe incorrectly, and there's nothing wrong with questioning things over and over again. That's what, that's what science does. We're, we're, not, we're not right. We're not 100% right. Science is pushing towards that, finding the, the true answer, but we don't know, we don't know any answers. Uh, and so that's kind of what I'm trying to, to get out there to people, and I'm trying to really get people to question both themselves, to question their narratives, and, and even to question our health leaders. When, when I get a patient that comes in and says, why do I need radiation? What about this? What about this? I've read this study. Like those are my favorite, pa- those are the best patients mm-hmm. because it's like, all right, we're going to work together as a team here. I'm going to explain to you why I think this works. You're going to tell me whether you agree with me or not. And then we're going to move forward. It, I think more people need to do that with, with their own health, especially if it's not working. So, you know, a, a good example is people that are on a low fat diet that, and they're getting fatter. It's like, all right, maybe low fat is the way to go, which obviously it's not, but maybe it is, but it's not working. So let's do the opposite. But they're so scared to question that because that is, that's the Bible. You have to do this, that it leads to other issues. And then you're scared to question other aspects of your health. And then you find yourself 40 years down the road and not, not very healthy. So I just want people to question their narratives. And a lot of these sacred cows are, are false narratives and, and that's getting proven basically on a daily basis. And, and that, that was the, the point of my book. It was just questioning these things that were driving me up a wall because they weren't backed by a lot of credible science. One gets the sense when reading the book that it was a passion-driven endeavor. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. You, you know, in thinking about this, by almost any reasonable standard, science writ large has been incredibly successful. And yet we see evidence increasingly of problems. Frankly, too many scientific findings turn out to be false or at least unsupportable or unable to be replicated. And scientific method is not the problem here. I want to stress that. But rather career pressures coupled with widespread conflicts of interest and human uh, frailty, frankly, are at the root of this issue. John Ioannidis and colleagues at Stanford have recently founded the Meta Research Innovation Center, cleverly uh, going by the acronym METRICS, which will study research practices and how they can be substantially improved. Some of the myths in your book are the product of this kind of faulty science that they wish to address. I understand that you're also a fan of John Ioannidis and of his mission. I wonder if you could give us your thoughts on his work and on this topic more generally. Yeah, he, he is, he's great. He's so intriguing. His, his articles are amazing. And, and the center that they set up is so desperately needed. Um, and, and I, to step back, I agree with your first comment. Science is great uh, and science and medicine is great, but there are many issues that come about with studies. And, and he brings these up better than anyone else. He brings them up mathematically, scientifically, he's, he's humorous. Uh, and this is why we need to question 
things and re-question and re-question and re-question. You need to prove things are right multiple times. You can't do one little mouse study in very special mice and then all of a sudden say, this is it. This is what you should do. This is what people should do. And let's set this in stone and, and 30 years down the road, be like, what the heck were you doing? What? This was just from a little mouse study. I mean, the whole cholesterol issue, the whole fat issue was from a rabbit study. I mean, a, a, a rabbit study, rabbits don't eat anything like humans, yet that's what we based basically the whole food pyramid in our whole country on for, for decades. And this is why we need to question things. And it's, it's annoying that it took this long, but in the grand scheme of things, you know, it's 30 or 40 years, you know, we've been here for millions, so maybe it's not that long, but um, there, there's many issues with, with science and there's many issues with current clinical trials, even the gold standard randomized, you know, phase three clinical trials, special interests come into play. He, he had a paper that showed that 50% of the time these major well done clinical trials are proven wrong. So, and, and I know in the book, I'm doing the same thing. I'm quoting studies and a lot of these studies may be proven wrong in the future. And again, that's fine. We just need to get closer to the right answer. And by being scared to question others and ourselves, we're never going to get there. So it's good that we have someone like Ioannidis uh, questioning these things. And, and, and he is unapologetically but humorously very successful at doing this. So I'm interested, I'm interested to see what comes about with his work. Yeah, he's the guy with a pin in the land of balloons. Yes, yeah. <laughs> and, and he's so smart that you can't even argue with him. Yeah, he's, he's an impressive guy. Yeah. I don't always listen to podcasts, but when I do, I listen to STEM Talk, interviewing the most interesting people in the world of science and technology. Stay curious, my friends. So Colin, you're an Italophile and love Italian food, but obviously not the pasta and bread that's commonly associated with Italian cuisine. What are some of your favorite Italian foods? Wow, some of my favorites. So I love wine. Does that count? <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, I love uh, Italian cheese. Uh, I love squid, octopus. Uh, I love the organ meat aspects of traditional Italian cooking. I love uh, Florentine steak and the uh, Roman uh, tripe, which I had last week, uh, it is amazing. You know, they do such a great job of taking these foods that when I mention them, most people's stomachs turn, but they make them absolutely delicious. And, and getting back, yeah, getting back to the insects and some of these other comments, like that's why I love their cooking so much. They take these traditional foods that we have shunned for no apparent reason that are very healthy, very nutrient dense, and they make them delicious and then combine that with the most beautiful country in the world and it's pretty amazing yeah did you try some payata when you were over there i did not what is uh, what is that google it up but uh, okay uh, <clears throat> it's uh intestine uh like a baby you stuffed with uh the milk mother's milk and uh it looks kind of like a bowl of rigatoni or something wow You'll be like that, that. That's intense. I will. I have to go back now. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, the doll 1887 has got a great example. Of okay. That. All right, great. And pistachio. <laughs> Thank you. So speaking of Italian food, everyone seems to advocate the Mediterranean diet, but no one seems to really agree what it is, other than it's really cool and it's good for you. Since you've already whacked a bunch of sacred cows, would you like to tell us your view? Would you like to tell us your views on the Mediterranean diet? Wow. Yeah, that is, I don't know why I have a, um, I have a 20 page PDF on this. That I'm going to post on my site. I don't know why I did not put it in my book, but yeah, the Mediterranean diet is one of those things that just irks me. So there, there's so many issues with it. The, the initial studies from Greece, uh, took a group of, of Grecians that were, that fasted, I forget how many, it's almost half the year. They fast like half the year and they didn't include that in the assessment of the data. So first off, the question is, is the Mediterranean diet that healthy or was it the fact that these people fasted? I, I think it's probably both. Um, then the next question is, yeah, what is a Mediterranean diet? It, you know, it depends on who you talk to. Vegan, vegetarian groups, I was in an argument with one last night, says that it's a, a plant-based diet. Another thing, I don't know what that means, but very low in fat, very low in meat, very high in vegetables and very high in grains. And, and 
I've been there many, 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 many times. I've traveled all up and down the coast of Italy, which is ensconced by the Mediterranean. I've traveled into Croatia. I lived in Slovakia for a summer and traveled all around. Obviously, Slovakia is not Mediterranean, but, but around the Croatian and the Adriatic area. And they eat a, a hell of a lot of meat. So I, I don't know where that's, that's coming from. Mm -hmm. um, the Italians eat a lot of cheese. Uh, the one thing that, that irks me is I do like my vegetables and they do not eat a lot of vegetables in Italy. You have to like bother the chef to go back and make them. And, and maybe this is a modern phenomenon. I don't know, but it's certainly not all vegetables. Um, unfortunately, I think it's actually a little bit low on vegetables. And the, the grain aspect, these whole grains that are pouring from the faucets, you just don't see even when they bring bread to the table, it's actually, it's usually white bread. Uh, so, and again, this varies where you go. The further south you get, you get some more fish, you get some more octopus, those kind of things. But from all of my travels, I've noticed that the food is whole foods. So it's plants that are actually cooked, meals that are actually cooked. Uh, there's not a lot of processed food, except for there is a lot of cured meat. Um, there's there's cheeses and then of course there's a, there's a lot of wine so you're eating real food you're eating real cooked meals they take pride in it there but it it is certainly not a low fat diet uh even if you go up to spain you know they're having a lot of they had a study up there where they drank a lot of olive oil uh, they talk a lot about nuts you see very little nut consumption throughout italy uh in croatia or in the adriatic side so I don't know, you read these articles, they're like gospel. I, don't, I, I think it just depends on where you are, who you talk to. But again, the premise overall is that it's, it's real food. It's certainly not low fat. And you eat the food over a long period of time, conversing with, with loved ones, looking out over the Mediterranean Sea and spending the rest of the day walking up steep inclined hills or walking miles at a time. So is it the diet? Is it the social aspects? I mean, we have no clue at this point because it's just one of these typical vague esoteric diets that, that kind of permeates throughout the medical field. It is made up by two guys in California. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Never been to Italy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So, Colin, we've discussed a bunch of health-related topics today. If you were to summarize your general health philosophy, what would it be? My general health philosophy is do what has what we've done for years upon years which is has been proven over time eat real foods get 8 hours of sleep a night limit your carbohydrates based on your hunger exercise intensely at times and not intensely all the time walk as much as you can Never use the elevator. Always take the stairs. Always park in the back corner of the parking lot. Question everything and cook all your meals. Wow, that was a good list. Right, Perfect. Thanks. Love it. Right off the top <laughs> of the head. Yeah, love it. <laughs> Thank you. So now for an important question. Being a single good-looking doctor, when are you going to put your application in for the next season of The Bachelor? The ladies <laughs> want to know. <laughs> so... Uh, I, I am single. I'm in a very serious relationship, though, with a great person, so I don't think she would particularly be fond of me going on The Bachelor. Probably not. <laughs> um, so ha, you, you, you guys sound like every person I work with, my, my mom, my, my grandma, just my patients. I, I, I was in Italy last week and got back, and all my patients were like, so, do you have news for us? <laughs> uh, it. it it, it's no bachelor for me. Um, I got to keep. I got to stay le legit in the field, and I think being on a on a poppy show like that would would seriously hurt my credibility. So, Colin, time has just flown by, and it's been a lot of fun. You shared a lot of great information here on STEM Talk. So, thank you again for joining us today. Hey, thanks for having me. It's it's a great great podcast. It's by far my favorite podcast. It's it's amazing the work you guys are doing. So, please keep it up. Whoa, thanks, Colin. Thank you. Great welcome. to chat with you. Great chatting with you guys. STEM talk. 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 Wow, that was certainly a fun and informative interview. Dr. Champ is impressive on several levels and is a ray of hope in what sometimes seems like an increasingly bleak medical landscape. I'm sure that his patients count themselves as fortunate to be working with him 
through what for them must be difficult times. I invite you to visit the STEM Talk webpage where one can find the show notes for this episode, including a link to his book, Misguided Medicine, a link to his blog, and a link to his earlier lecture at IHMC. The show notes can be found at stemtalk.us. This is Don Cornegas signing off for now. And this is Ken Ford saying goodbye until we meet again on STEM Talk. Thank you for listening to STEM Talk. We want this podcast to be discovered by others. So please take a minute to go to iTunes to rate the podcast and perhaps even write a review. More information about this and other episodes can be found at our website, stemtalk.us. There, you can also find more information about the guests we interview.